Okay, everybody. So, as you can see on the screen, I have eight series that the channel is going to be doing on Japanese history. So, as of right now, and I'm saying this in about the middle of August 2020, we have four complete series that are, you know, recorded and edited, and because I'm a workaholic with YouTube, this is basically going on well before I will actually upload and release all these series. So The Age of the Samurai and Japanese Nationalism, I have already started. They are now complete, and they will be uploaded over the coming weeks, once I start putting these videos up again. Um, the other two I have done in yellow. So, Japanese Civilization Prehistory to 1868, and then 1868 to present. I initially had thought about doing a series on the Japanese colonial empire and Manchukuo, which is the stuff in blue. So the stuff in blue as of August 2020 is not complete yet, I need to start doing it. Uh, but it occurred to me that talking about stuff like, you know, the Japanese justifications for the Second World War, who Goto Shinpei is, who was a Japanese colonial uh, administrator, the development of state Shinto, etc., probably would be useless unless on the channel there already existed a series of whatever you want to call them, lectures, videos, whatever, uh, giving a broad outline of Japanese history so you guys have something to connect the deeper details to. So, Japanese Civilization Prehistory to 1868, which is what we're doing in this series, is exactly what it sounds like. I'm going through a broad, you know, series of videos on that topic, and we're going to be talking about in this series how the Japanese state develops, its relation with mainland East Asia, etc. 1868 to present is modern Japan, it's exactly what you think it is. Uh, so with that said, let's get going. So, before we get started with anything, the most important thing we have to get out of the way is dating systems. So there are three main ways of breaking up Japanese history. The first way, which because, statistically, most of you guys who are watching this are American or European, that you are probably familiar with, is the way we break up, you know, European history. So ancient, or classical, if you want to use that word. Um, then we go into the early medieval period, high medieval, late medieval, and then early modern, you know, renaissance, enlightenment period, all that stuff. So, when you look at Japanese history and you're like, oh, okay, there's the Warring States era, the Sengoku Jidai of, you know, pop culture fame. This is medieval Japan, or early modern. Yeah, that, that's not necessarily, like, an incorrect way of viewing Japanese history. It just runs into problems, and a lot of professionals don't really care for it, because what it's doing is it's taking a system of historical chronology, and a way of breaking up history. Designed for Europe, and it's applying it to a place that is not Europe, so you run into a lot of issues. The second way of doing things is you could break up Japanese history based on the reign of different emperors. So every emperor has to, well, technically speaking, they didn't always do this, but technically speaking, when an emperor comes into power, they have to give a reign name to their period of rule. So, that's another way of doing it, but the problem with that is that throughout Japanese history, so many different emperors have gained and lost power, and some emperors have come into power, lost it, and then come back into power, that breaking it up based on reign name can be difficult, because you don't necessarily know who's in charge. There's also been hundreds of Japanese emperors, so it gets confusing very fast. The third way of doing it, which is the way you'll typically see in, you know, books and articles written by professionals on Japanese history, is this. So, we have all these different time periods, and they're all broken up based on general, cultural, or political developments. So, in this series, Japanese history from, you know, the prehistoric era to 1868, we're basically going from the Paleolithic to the very start of the Meiji Restoration, or a major revolution, if you prefer that term, and we'll talk about the issues with deciding whether it's a restoration or a, you know, revolution. Uh, but this is basically what we're doing. So in this video, what we're going to cover is the Paleolithic, to the extent that we can, the Jomon, 
and a little bit of the, uh, you know, yayoi period. So, with that said, let's get going. Before we get into the nuts and bolts and the meat of Japanese history, I just want to stress one thing. In addition to the different ways of breaking up the history of Japan, there are, broadly speaking, two main ways of looking at its history. The first is, well, you can look at the Japanese islands geographically and you say, okay, here's mainland East Asia, and here are the Japanese islands. Between them are, you know, a bunch of seas. There's water between them. So to get from the mainland to the Japanese islands, and vice versa, you have to go by ship. So what that means in, you know, I guess kind of big picture terms is that if you want intellectual developments, China is a hotbed and Korea is a hotbed, of Buddhist and Confucian and, you know, other uh, religious and philosophical traditions. So if a Japanese monk wants to go study in, say, Chang'an in China, they have to get on a ship and they have to go across the water. This is not a road system. This is not something you could, like, hypothetically, you know, in the spirit of Skyrim or some other RPG, like D&D, this is not something you could hypothetically take to the road to by yourself and just travel. In order to get on a ship, you need a crew. So, for intellectual and cultural exchanges, there's a lot of stuff you have to do in order to facilitate that. Yeah, technically speaking, the Japanese islands at their closest extent are about 50 miles from the Korean Peninsula, but that's still 50 miles over freaking water that you have to traverse. Um, just as well, armies cannot necessarily traverse this very easily. They can, it's just very expensive, and when the Mongols come, you stand the risk of having, you know, typhoons wipe out the ships. So, it's very easy to look at the history of Japan as, well, it's disconnected from the Asian mainland, therefore Japan develops in isolation. Yeah, there's some contacts with East Asia, but really it develops in isolation. That's not an incorrect view, it's just that if you argue for that, you're going to come away with an incomplete picture of Japanese history. Okay, so what's the other way? Well, if way one is viewing it in isolation, view two must be viewing Japanese history as a full member of East Asia. Yes and no. Um, like I said, the Japanese islands are disconnected from East Asia. To get there is a little difficult. So the second and the really best way of viewing the history of Japan in, you know, big, big picture idea here is that the history of Japan is kind of like a pendulum, right? It's swinging from one side to the other. So on one side, you have, well, this is the Japanese islands. We have our own institutions, we have our own culture. Sometimes we like to cut ourselves off from the world, and they do this multiple times. The most famous probably being the, uh, you know, Tokugawa era of seclusion in the 1700s. There are others, and we'll talk about them, but the Tokugawa probably is the most famous one. The other is that, well, Here's mainland East Asia. So there's all these different cultural ideas and political ideas, and they come over to Japan. So the pendulum swings occasionally from isolation to being a member of East Asian society. So it goes back and forth. So my point with this is that the history of the Japanese islands is, at one and the same time, um, a history of a people in isolation and a history of a people very much in full contact with their neighbors. So... With that said, by 1500 BCE or BC, if you prefer that dating nomenclature, roughly, um, on the East Asian mainland, what we typically think of now as China was unified through a series of wars into the uh, Zhao Dynasty. The Zhao Dynasty lasts for a very, very long time. It then breaks apart into the Japanese, or Chinese, excuse me, Warring States period. So, the Chinese Warring States period is exactly what it sounds like. It's a period when there are a, you know, a, a myriad of different political units. Some of them are what we would consider like large states. Others are what we would consider maybe city-states. Uh, but they're all in armed conflict with each other. Well, by about 226... And definitely by 221, one of those states, Qin, manages to pretty much unite everybody else. This is the Qin Dynasty. 
the Qin Dynasty collapses into around 205, 206, and then we get the Han Dynasty, it lasts until about 220 CE or AD, that falls, and then we have a long series of multiple different dynasties that deal in differing ways with what's going on in the Korean Peninsula, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but by 618, China is reunified under the Tang Dynasty, and peace is more or less restored. Uh, so, throughout all this time, what's happening? And what does this have to do with the history of Japan? Well, pretty much everything. Because throughout all this time, it's not just warfare. It's very easy to look at you know, history in big picture strokes as, well, here's politics, and here is armed military action. And those aren't incorrect ways of looking at it. It's just that looking at only those two things, only those two facets, will again lead to an incomplete picture. So while all this political strife and while all these wars are going on, what else is happening in East Asia? Well, Buddhism comes in, um, Confucianism is developed, and legalism and Taoism. And so we have, throughout all this, you know, period, through all this time of stress and conflict and war, we have religious cultural, so literary, artistic, etc., uh, philosophical developments, which by the time East Asia is pretty much reunified under the Tang Dynasty, have had over a thousand years to really develop and flourish. So when this stuff, like Buddhism and Confucianism, etc., moves into the Japanese islands and the states that would gradually coalesce into the Yamato dynasty around the 600s-ish start dealing with things like Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism. These philosophies and these ideas have already had a very, very long history, and they're very closely tied up with political developments in the East Asian mainland. So it is impossible to understand these ideas and the way they influenced ancient Japan and the way Japanese states developed without understanding that basically without development on the mainland in this period, you probably would not get Japan or ancient Japan in the way that we understand ancient Japan today. By far, probably the most important series of relations the ancient Japanese had was with the ancient kingdoms in Korea. So, we go in three different stages here, but before we get to that, um, I just want to call your attention to this little map I did. So, what you're looking at is basically the Korean Peninsula, and what is today, like, half of, you know, Manchuria. So, that little one is uh, Kigorio. So, one, two, and three represent the famous three kingdoms of Korea. So, we have uh, Kigorio in the north, we have Pakche in the lower left, that's two. Uh, Pakche has a very close relationship, and we'll talk about why that is in, in a few minutes, with the ancient Japanese in the ancient Japanese state once the Yamato dynasty starts, you know, developing. And then we have uh, Silla. So Silla is the country that eventually unites the Korean Peninsula, and they do this with the aid of the Chinese. So Pakche has a very strong relationship with ancient Japan. Silla has a very strong relationship with ancient China, specifically the uh, Sui and then the Tang dynasties. So, okay, those are the three kingdoms of Korea. What's this green thing? Kaya, uh, and I have Mimana in parentheses. We'll talk about this in a sec. So we have the three kingdoms of Korea, Kagoria, Pakche, and Silla. Ancient texts and ancient, you know, inscriptions, stuff like that. Talk about this other thing, this little fourth kind of state, or what looks like a state. And this is Kaya, or Gaia. Sometimes it's spelled with a G, but it's A-Y-A, -A, no matter which first letter you use. This is not necessarily like a state in the sense that China was a state, or the sense that Pakistan was a state. This appears to have been more of a local uh, confederacy. So... The historiography is divided here. Ancient Korean and ancient Chinese texts talk about this place called Kaya. Ancient Japanese texts talk about this place called Mimana. And Mimana was this, as best we can tell from ancient Japanese texts anyway, uh, Mimana was this place to the west and to the north, so 
I guess, broadly speaking, maybe somewhere in Korea, that the Japanese state, that they had a some kind of a, a martial outpost. Something. We don't really know what it was. Some kind of a Japanese outpost. So, the problem with equating Mimana with Kaya is that that was done throughout Japanese history um, to eventually justify, or in part justify, the Japanese colonization of Korea. So, any any discussion of Kaya and Mimana, um, and we're not going to really get into it in this series of videos because it's not overly important. We'll talk about it more in the, you know, in-depth series I have planned, but any attempt to really talk about this thing is, in the literature, you're going to find uh, it's, it's very polarized, and it also gets very difficult and very heavy in terms of emotion sometimes, and it, it can happen very quickly. Um, but I want to call your attention to that, mainly because this is just one of those things where there is still controversy over. It's not entirely clear exactly what Kaya was, but ignoring that, um, we have, like I said, three main stages of Japanese interactions with the Korean Peninsula. So stage one, we don't really know when it starts, uh, but it, it goes until about 407 CE. So what's happening is Western Japan. So Kyushu, Shikoku, uh, Tsushima, a chunk of, of uh, you know, Honsu. So the Western chunk of the Japanese islands, at their closest extent, is our approximately 50 miles from the Korean Peninsula. So, there's a lot of cultural exchange going on. And it's from the Korean Peninsula that Western Japan and the peoples and, you know, little tiny societies in Western Japan get things like rice cultivation. We don't really know how it shows up in Japan, but it does. And it, as far as we can tell, comes through the Korean Peninsula. Iron shows up and Strangely enough, iron shows up in Japan before bronze. And then when bronze does show up, it's still used for, like, ceremonial purposes, whereas iron is used for weapons. Um, and then there's also what appears to have been heavy immigration from Korea. Stage 2 goes between about 407 and about 562. So, Kaya, whatever that was, falls in about... 562 to the kingdom of Scylla. So the Scylla developed very close relations, they developed a close working relationship with China. It's through China that they get some of their military uh, equipment. It's through China they get some of their philosophical ideals, etc. Well, Pakche fills that role for Japan. So it's through Pakche in the 5th and 6th centuries that the ancient Japanese state starts getting you know, things like Buddhism. They get things like gold working, iron working, um, Chinese writing appears to have entered Japan through Pakche, etc. And they develop a very close working relationship to the extent that there's some evidence that when the Silla were attempting to conquer Pakche, uh, the Japanese, or what eventually becomes the ancient Japanese, sent something, some kind of a military expedition to Pakche to help them out. Uh, so it's that kind of relationship. Stage three is, well, in 663, Scylla and the Tung Alliance destroy Pakche. In, 60, in 668, the kingdom of uh, Kagorio falls, and the Tung recognize the Scylla as basically uniting the Korean Peninsula. After this, China and Korea are now hostile to the Yamato, to the ancient Japanese, and you see archaeologically along the western coast of Japan, uh, there's a long series of fortifications that are developed because the Japanese are kind of scared that, well, we have enemies across the sea now, and they have a big navy, maybe they're going to try to invade. And it's for this reason that a lot of ancient Japanese institutions change. They go from a Japanese way of doing things to a Chinese way of doing things, specifically Tung, uh, as a way to kind of strengthen the indigenous Japanese state using Chinese models, which they can see have been very successful, as a way to make the state stronger to ward off that potential Chinese invasion. So, to sum everything up, Korea, and by extension mainland East Asia and Japan in the ancient period, have a very, very tight relationship. It's not always friendly, 
But that relationship is there, and it's very crucial for the development of ancient Japanese society. Now, the, I guess, main problem of doing ancient history, any kind of ancient history, really, and medieval history to an extent, um, is that the stuff humans tend to write on is organic material, and that stuff doesn't tend to survive. So, paper, leather, you know, organic materials rot, um, you can inscribe stuff on stone, that weathers away. So, ancient Japan has a series of texts that record their ancient history. So, I think technically there are six. There are two main ones, and we'll talk about them later on, the Kojiki and the uh, Nihon Shoki. Okay, well, we have ancient texts, um, there's, and there's some Chinese stuff, but what else? Well, for ancient history, the real go-to thing as far as source material is concerned is the hard physical material evidence of archaeology. Um, the Japanese, well, the, the modern Japanese state is very interested in their own history. So, in Japan, archaeology is conducted in a way that it is not really conducted necessarily in other nations. So, as of 2012, the sheer amount of archaeological sites and archaeological material, etc., that we have from Japan is 465,021 different locations, and of that large number, 403,057 basically survive, uh, you know, more or less pretty intact. We have about 9,000, roughly, uh, new archaeological sites every single year. And the Japanese government, in order to manage all these sites, maintains the single largest archaeological bureaucracy in the world. So, in other countries, you're an academic, you're an archaeologist, yeah, you could get, uh, I guess, local state or a, a provincial position, but really, a lot of times you're looking for a job either in industry or in the academy. But in Japan, if you're an archaeologist, because this is such a booming industry, you can basically go work for the government, and you may potentially always have a job. Uh, so, when the Japanese government is doing archaeology, what happens is when a new archaeological site is found, no matter where it is, and no matter what is planned to be built on top of it, that construction cannot proceed until that site has basically been entirely excavated and, you know, documented. So, what this means for the study of Japanese prehistory is that we have a sheer amount of, of material data that other countries don't necessarily have. Um, so, the public also takes a very big interest in this, so kids and adults both participate in archaeological digs. In a way, this is basically Japan's version. Uh, of public history. So, it is through the study of archaeology, and you know, what I have here is basically just reinforcing what I just said. Um, you know, the discoveries are frequently very strongly looked upon by the public, and you know, the strong media interest, etc. So, what this means for the study of Japanese prehistory is that we just have a lot of data. So, how do the Japanese get into the Japanese islands? Uh, well, a lot of the archaeology suggests that there were migrations from what are, you know, today the countries of Korea, what is today China, so not all of China, but pretty much like North China and the uh, Liaotang Peninsula. People moved in gradually. There does not necessarily appear to have been a mass movement of people. This is probably something that happened very slowly over time. Uh, but the Japanese themselves are not native to the Japanese islands. The original natives are the uh, Ainu people, and we will talk about them in later videos. So, there are two different ethnic groups in Japan, which is my main point with this. Uh, there's the Japanese and the uh, Ainu. So, eventually we start developing pottery, we start developing agriculture. So this is the Jomon and the uh, Yayoi periods, and it's through the intensive study of Japanese archaeology and Japanese prehistory that we basically know a great deal about both of these time periods. And by the way, um, on the bottom of the screen here, some sites are developed for visitors, and we're going to talk about one in uh, particular 
as it relates to the Yayoi period and Queen Himiko, but that's for the next video. So, the German period, or the German culture, Jidai is the Japanese word, is the first real period of Japanese history that we can really solidly document. So, when you are studying archaeology, when you're conducting archaeology, um, different cultures take their name for, or names from different type sites. So this might be like the first site you've excavated on a given culture, or this might be like the most populous site of a given culture. You can also take uh, a culture's name from different artifacts produced. So the German culture is an example of the latter way of doing things. So what you're looking at the bottom right hand corner of the screen here is rather simple pottery. And you see these marks on it. So these marks are created uh, when the clay is still wet. You basically press string or twine into it, and the result is what's known as German pottery. So German means cord marked. Um, so and we're going to talk more about this in the more in-depth series I have planned, because this is just like an overview. But this is basically discovered in the 1800s because there's a, I believe he's British, yeah, there's a British archaeologist and, well, somebody who dabbled in archaeology. He's on a train in Tokyo, and he's looking out the window, and he sees all these different mounds, and he's like, those don't look natural. They kind of look man-made. So he eventually excavates a bunch of them, and he finds, like, all this different pottery, um, and he names it the German culture, the German period, which extends... Roughly 16,750 years before present. It's kind of when it starts. I have that on the screen here. Uh, but the German period is close to 20,000 years old. Or, you know, 20,000 years in duration. As of right now, South China has the earliest pottery in the world. It used to be the German culture. This stuff is always getting pushed back, so... It's entirely possible that in the future Japan will have the documented earliest cases of pottery. But my point with this is that the German culture is the first era of Japanese history we really have documented, and it takes its name from this pottery, this cord marked pottery. So, yeah, the, the more conservative date for the German period is approximately 13,000 years. Eh. You can push it closer to 20,000, depending on how you break up different archaeological sites and some typology, but that's neither here nor there for this video. Uh, but the German period is potentially the most materially affluent hunter-gatherer society known to the modern world. Um, that being said, life for these people was still kind of nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, the average height of a male is five foot three. The average height of a female is four foot eleven. Adult life expectancy, you can see it on the screen. Women tended to die between 16 and 24 from childbirth. And they also have malnutrition. Now, this is where it gets weird for the study of hunter-gatherer societies. So, based on a lot of bioarchaeology and a lot of dentistry specifically, the bones of hunter-gatherers and their teeth tend to, when compared to the modern day, actually be in relatively good shape. They didn't eat a lot of sugar and things that would necessarily wear down the bones. Agriculturally dependent people, on the other hand, have weaker bones and weaker dentistry because we eat a lot of grains, we eat a lot of sugar, things that just wear down the bone, things that cause rot. Um, but the German period has, or the people in the German period, rather, have poor dental health. Why? We're going to see in a minute why that is. There are, you know, some settlements, there is some plant domestication, uh, but this by and large appears to have been society that was largely egalitarian. And it was a society, at least from what we can tell archaeologically, relatively devoid of social stratification. So the German period has, or had, um, active plant management, and we can tell this based on a couple different things. So the first is impressions made from the pottery. So much in the way that you would mark the still wet, unfired pottery with, you know, string, uh, 
you could also do this with nets, which we can infer probably were developed for catching fish, maybe catching birds. Uh, but there are, you know, or is evidence of fabrics and baskets and textiles. So that stuff comes from the pottery. There's also um, archaeological negatives. So these are differences in, you know, discrepancies in the earth when you excavate that show evidence of dugout boats, bow staves, etc. And on top of all this, there is um, evidence of stone working. So they're making grindstones, mortar and pestles. They do have some basic agricultural tools, so axes, hoes. Uh, these tend to be made of stone. As far as I'm aware, we don't have any evidence of, like, metallurgy in this period. But that could always turn up, although I doubt it. Now, going back to that plant management and the relatively crappy dental health and bone structure of the German people... If they're hunter-gatherers and they're not really eating sugary foods, things that would cause cavities in, you know, teeth, why is it that these people have issues with their dentistry? And the answer is that the act of plant management, the, the, the stuff they're growing are things like chestnuts. Um, so these are soft plants that when you eat them and you chew them and you break them down, it's kind of like eating bread. It breaks down into a sugar and over time it can actually rot your teeth. And in an era without modern-day dentistry and toothpaste and, well, modern-day notions of dental health, uh, yeah, you see where this is going. Uh, they also produce or grow lacquer trees to... So, the, the Japanese islands get impacted every year by the monsoons coming out of the Indian Ocean. So, in order to prevent things from rotting, you have to lacquer it. Well, this is also dangerous in this period because the trees and other plants they're using to get the sap to make the lacquer are extremely toxic. So people probably died from managing these plants. But I think that the thing we should really take away with this, um, or from this, is that this is not a society of, like, you know, the stereotypical cavemen that we think of. You know, the uh, Unga Bunga people who live in caves, who hunt with clubs and take their kill back to their caves, and then live in the caves. These, these people were, for the time period, relatively advanced. They had pottery. It de it's definitely, you know, fired. Um, some of it potentially was glazed. You can maybe put lacquer on that. They have active plant management, so they know how to grow things. So, for the Stone Age, the German period was advanced. Now, after the German period, is the Yayoi. So the Yayoi is the first fully agricultural phase in Japan. So this is where we get an issue with dates. Uh, at the earliest, we have evidence of about 1000 BCE. Usually the traditional dates are like 300 BCE to 300 CE, although archaeology can push the Yayoi period back to 1000, roughly. Um, it first appears in northern Kyushu. So we don't really know how wet rice agriculture reached the Japanese islands. What we do know is that it came via the Korean Peninsula and from the Korean Peninsula probably came from northern China. Maybe not Manchuria, but like around that region. Um, and it spread south through Korea to Kyushu and then it spread south into Kyushu and northeast into Honshu, into the main Japanese islands. So Every archaeological period takes its name from a different type site or something. The Yayoi period takes its name from the Tokyo neighborhood where the first Yayoi period site was excavated, also in the 19th century. Um, so, the Kofun period, and we'll talk about this in the next video, comes next. The Kofun period is when we start noticing, like, large-scale state formation, or what appears to be state formation. Um, and the German, the Yayoi, and the Kofun period, all three of these guys are not, like I said in the beginning, these are not separate from what's going on on mainland East Asia, especially in Korea. So as polities are emerging in the Japanese islands, they're also emerging in Korea and they're emerging in China. So what we have here is this kind of triangle trade and triangle interaction of diplomacy, war, migration, tech transfer, and trade. So in the next video, we're going to be talking about the uh, Yayoi period, Queen Himiko and the transition into the Kofun period and what eventually looks like the development of a Japanese kind of proto-state. So if you have any questions, leave me a comment or check out the bibliography I have listed below.